Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. My name is David Delk. I'm president of the Portland chapter of the Alliance for Democracy, and I'm your host today. So we have two, two uh, guests today uh, who are both running for political office. Uh, directly next to me is Woodrow Branix. Broadnax. Broadnax, thank you. And Steve Reynolds. Uh, and uh, Wood, uh, Woodrow is running uh, for the th Green Party, uh, Pacific Green Party nomination running against Congressional District Representative Earl Blumenauer. And Stephen is currently running for what was David Wu's seat in the, congr in the first Congressional District on the uh, no, Oregon Progressive Party ticket. And that election is coming right up. And election day is, what is the election day? January 31st is ja the ballot date. Right, okay. And so Ballots we'll, have been out since, la well, they were mailed last Friday. Okay, good. All right, yeah. So my question to both of you, and I guess I'll direct it to you first, is why are you running for an office that's been occupied by Earl Blumenauer for the past 12 years? Uh, who is really pretty popular in the district. Well, for 45 years, I've lived here in the state of Oregon, and for 12 of those uh, years, uh, Earl has been the congressional district representative. And I cannot understand how we can be in the condition that we are in. Uh, it is much as he's been there 12 years, so there's something wrong with multiple candidacies. Mm -hmm. And I believe that uh, it, as nice a person as Earl is, that he is certainly not one of the 99 percent. If we were to look at his past record in terms of his voting record, in terms of the actual monies that he has, which is being put up under our, a microscope, uh, he owns a lot of property. He is a part of the 1 percent. And we as the 99 percent need to be able to say to him, produce for us and not for the trillionaires. And this is why I got into this election, okay. because I want to represent the people, because people are important, and not uh, the financial designation that is put on a personhood. No, it is people. Mm -hmm. Okay. Steve? Well, I'm not really running against anyone. Uh, okay. This is an open seat. But I do feel that the Democratic and Republican parties themselves are responsible for the pain that people are suffering in this country. Um, they, as Mr. Broadnax said, they don't feel our pain. They don't know what it's like to worry about getting enough hours to, to pay their bills, to, to keep the lights on, to make their mortgage payments. Um, they've lost touch with what it means to be a citizen, and they're, they have a cynical self-interest in being reelected and raising funds to further their reelection. and I'm not okay with that. Uh, I think we need to bring our government back to the people. We need to, we need to stop electing millionaires. We need to stop electing lawyers. We need to stop electing the, the businessmen type who've put us in the position that we're in right now uh, as a country. We, <laughs> we need to reject Democrats and Republicans alike. Um, let them know that we're not okay with the way things are going. We're not okay with their failed leadership. Uh, and we're gonna do something about it, that our voices will be heard. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and, and do you think that uh, Democrats and Republicans automatically should be rejected? I think indivi at an individual level there, there, are men, there are men and women in Congress and, and the Senate who are to be admired for their records. Uh, collectively they represent organizations, parties that while they say one thing have no interest in actually doing it. They pay lip service to progressive, Democrats pay lip service to progressive values. Um, I truly believe that. I truly believe that if you're a Democrat in Oregon, you're actually a progressive, and I would challenge you to look at our platform and say that you're not. Um, I think people are cynical in that they don't believe third party candidates are, are viable because they've never heard of us or they don't know who we are or what we stand for. And that's perpetuated by a media bubble that uh, I'm, I've personally fought uh, being ignored by the media, uh, being marginalized. Uh, it's, it's difficult to overcome, and, and, and people have had, I've had difficulty t getting people to take me seriously because they haven't heard of me mm -hmm. uh, until I was actually on the ballot, uh, <laughs> which I am now. Um, I'm starting to get, people are taking me seriously. People are, are exploring what I'm saying. They're exploring the Progressive Party platform. And I'm getting so much encouragement and so much hope from 
from people who never thought they had a choice between Democrat and Republican. Yeah, and, and I, I think that I saw a poll recently that had you polling really pretty well for a minor party candidate. <laughs> um, well, 8% uh, amongst voters 35, 18 to 35 was is the most recent poll. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, I, I, I think that's amazing, considering that the media, when they refer to this race, they, they say Suzanne Bonamici, they say Rob Cornelius, and then they say the Libertarian and Progressive Party candidates, without actually referring to my name. Um, that's, that's great. And I think the best, the best advertising I could have done is getting my name and, and picture and my message into the voters' pamphlet, uh, so every voter has a chance to see it. Um, it personally wiped out my savings. I'm at a huge yeah. fundraising disadvantage, but it was it was worth it. Mm. Uh, I, I received touching messages and, and questions, and I've answered hundreds of emails since last Friday. Uh, and I'm not I'm not going anywhere. Democrats, no, Republicans, I'm staying here. I'll be here in the fall. Uh, if you don't think I can win, if you if you don't want a Republican to win, you think I'm trying to split the vote, vote for me anyways, because. Uh, so in this particular election that you're involved in right now that we're going to, or at least those folks in your congressional district are voting on, that seat will then immediately become uh, open for and contested. Uh, for and contested in the general election. Yes. Right, there, okay. Um, it's, it's a really a cynical thing that we're in right now because whoever is elected, regardless of party, they're going to go to Washington, they're going to accept their seat, and then they're going to begin the re-elections uh, campaign. So, so, so they'll Almost be in office for a period of a few months, well, and then they immediately go into uh, election mode again. Congress is working 109 days this year, uh, and they make $174,000 a day, or a year, rather. Um, but yes, they're going to go straight back into election mode, fundraising mode, and I think that's a cynical use of, of taxpayer time and money. I've made the pledge that if I'm elected, or when I'm elected, I will not use taxpayer time and money. I will stay in Washington and work for the people, and I and I choose and I choose not to campaign uh, because I can do. You can't work for the people and campaign at the same time. Mm -hmm. I, I choose to be judged upon my actions rather than my rhetoric. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can't. And again, if you're campaigning, that's all you're doing is you're spouting rhetoric. If you're working, you're you're in your position. You're in you're in your seat of of responsibility that you were elected to occupy, and you need to do that job. Okay. All right. Good. So, uh, talking about Earl Blumenauer, uh, who's been in office for 12 years, what issues would you focus on in your campaign against him? Uh, the just the weather situation that we're undergoing right now, in terms of we're in a deluge of rain. Uh, Blumenauer at one point um, wrote a bill which was called the floodplain bill uh, where he said that if your house is flooded we'll help you the first time but after the first time uh, you're on your own. Well how can we be on our own uh, when they're helping trillionaires in every aspect of their endeavor? People are, are basically needing help right now, serious help. And my thing, contention with Earl, is that as good a person as you are, why don't you come down and go into Turner and put on some rubber boots and walk through the water and look at the people and the faces and the hunger and the lack of electricity that they're suffering. If you're truly representing people, then be a people person. If you're truly representing the trillionaires, then acquiesce your position because they're not the ones that sent you to Washington, D.C. We sent you to represent us. And as my good friend was saying, 109 days, we want to work. You know, we, we, we need work. And I don't see Earl doing the things that are necessary for the livability and for the safety of the people. I have been a Democrat all of my life, 65 years. My family was Democratic. It became almost genetic that you were a Democrat. Mm -hmm. But after I began to see all of the wobbling, all of the things that are going on in Washington, D.C., it became very apparent to me that when we talk about the 1%, we're not talking about President Obama. We're not talking about uh, the 600 people that run the world. 
we are talking about our own Congress. Mm -hmm. And the multiple candidacies is what is killing us. We cannot inject fresh blood, fresh ideas, because the trillionaires are comfortable with being able to design those individuals that they already have in place. That's why the money comes so fluidly. When I ran uh, for city council, I experienced the same thing that my good friend was. I wasn't in the voters' pamphlet. I wasn't in uh, the... I ran on the premise that if you are hurting, then you'll vote for me. And I took East County from Sam Adams. Hmm. And this was documented. However, the, mon the money to sustain the effort was not there. But I said this, and I made this campaign pledge. I'm not going to ask for any money. If you're bleeding and you need help, then I'm the person that's going to help you. And so on the basis of that, uh, my contention with Earl is simply this. He has shown me that he has no courage, no courage to stand up for our interests, but all the courage in the world to stand behind uh, wars, to stand behind uh, the things that are making us uncomfortable in this life, because we all got to live this world together. Mm -hmm. But he has done nothing for the citizenry of Northeast Portland. And as we look over the past 12 years, just look at the condition of Northeast Portland. As he's our representative, our congressman, we hear Wyden's name, we hear Schrader's name, we hear Merkley's name. But what do you hear about the invisible man? And that's what I have to call him, the invisible man, because he is not there. Mm -hmm. And he's not there for us. And that's why I'm in this race, to bring a strong voice and energy and solutions and ideas to a problem that is being stalemated by the trillionaires. Because if you do have those particular solutions at mind, then they'll call you up and say, oh, no, we don't want you to push this. If you want your money, push that. Keep it like it is. We're comfortable with it as it is. But we cannot be comfortable when people are dying. We cannot be comfortable when people's homes are being flooded. We can't be comfortable when our congressional representative speaks about the dust pollution of farms. And we're not talking about small farms. We're talking about mega farms. And it allows them to be able to continue to genetically induce in us an attitude and a behavior that is inhumane toward each other. And so I definitely feel that enough of Earl Blumenauer. It is time for you to go. You need to move, step aside, and bring in new energy, because your energy has become quite bland. Mm -hmm. And those who like the idea, because he's got a one fundraiser, which I watched the other day, how to make fruitcake. And it reminds me of uh, <laughs> Marie Antoinette. A national issue. <laughs> yeah. It reminds me of Marie Antoinette when she said, let them eat cake. How to make fruitcake sounds like a... Uh, like a how-to on get elected to Congress. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, and and it does nothing for us because I'll tell you, if you go, if when Christmas comes to you, if you can count the number of people that buy fruitcake or even know how to cook it or even want to eat it, then <laughs> so be it. But it is not representative of what the people need food. Mm -hmm. The people need jobs. The people need things that Earl should jump in if he was interested in us jump in and campaign for us. And he's not going to do it. He's been there 12 years. He's got all his money. He gets X amount of dollars. He's a millionaire. And he doesn't have our interest at heart. Okay. All right. Let, let's talk about some specific issues where you differ from both of the major party candidates. In your case, uh, but both of them, in your case, probably it will just be Earl. Uh, the Republicans may or may not in this district uh, actually run anybody against Earl. Uh, so what, what kind of policy differences do you both have uh, between the Democrats and the Republicans? Well, um, well, people say war is a terrible thing. Uh, the Oregon Progressive Party really believes it. Uh, we would like to end all the conflicts immediately. Uh, I personally have lost friends in this conflict, people that I saw nearly every day in my life at West Point. You talk about Iraq and Afghanistan. Iraq and Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. uh, we have military installations, 600 of them, or more than 600, spread out throughout the world, and none of those are are easier or inexpensive to maintain and operate. 
Um, we need to end these wars. We need to we need to reduce the size of our military. We need to to refocus our efforts on on rebuilding America. We have some of the most talented engineers and scientists in the world, and I've said this before. And what they're doing is they're figuring out better, faster, more efficient ways to kill people. And I think that's ridiculous. Where another place where we differ is I'm strongly for a single-payer health care system. I think that Medicare is an amazing program that meets the needs of our citizenry. Uh, it's, high, it's extremely efficient, and it's an existing government program that there's no excuse for myself or any other person not being able to enroll in it. The only so, so you're in favor of expanding the Medicare system so it doesn't just cover those over, what is it, 65? 65 and older. I mean, think right, about okay. it. The, six, the 65 and older, they're our most distinguished citizens. They also happen to be statistically the most expensive to provide care for. And they, they've been paying into the system their entire lives. Uh, in a small amount, and then they, they enroll in the system and they have their co-pays with Medicare. But we could defer, if we could defray those costs with younger, healthier people, uh, we, could, we could stop talking about saving Medicare uh, or changing Medicare, and we could start talking about how to make it stronger. Uh, we can make it stronger by making it more inclusive of, of our citizenry. I'm not saying we force people onto it, but given the choice, I think that businesses with their expensive uh, medical programs and small businesses who don't can't even afford medical programs would jump at the opportunity to enroll the, themselves and and their employees I'm not saying oh you can, there's no way you could open it up all at once that would be ridiculous the system would collapse but you can open it up to the youngest healthiest people first and then increment incrementally add people to the roles until uh, the system met the needs of those who need it. I think that that's another major difference. We're not talking about that though, because it's un it's it's not profitable for the corporate healthcare providers. Uh, it might put them out of business because they can't compete with Medicare because it's too efficient. Mm -hmm. They're perfectly willing to take care of you from the moment you're born until the moment you take turn 65. At which point uh, you become unprofitable and they turn you over to the taxpayers. It's disgusting and cynical, and, and I don't think it's okay. I think the best way to approach healthcare as a basic human right, which it is, no one has the no one has the right to say you do not deserve to live, uh, you do not deserve this life-saving care or this treatment that you need. Uh, bean counter, accountant, uh, bureaucrat, nobody, nobody has that right. If we if we provide a system that truly establishes a baseline for and for every citizen, uh, like the rest of our of our true competitors in the world, uh, then then we can not only increase our competitiveness as an industrialized nation, we can increase our humanity. Okay. All right. So, war and healthcare are two issues you feel like distinguish you from the Democrats and the Republicans. Yes, sir. Great. And how about you? As far Republicans as the, and Democrats. Both. Yes. Both Democrats and Republicans. Yes. And I can speak in terms of the Republicans in terms of what they have already provided us with, which is nothing. In terms of the Democrats, in whenever, as a soldier, whenever there's a hill to be taken, there's someone that stands up and says, charge, and you charge that hill, to take that hill. And what we have seen in the Democratic Party is that there is no leadership or courage to be able to implement that in a sustainable fashion. A lot of lip service, a lot of what we have gone, what I have gone through for the last 65 years. Now, I'm not an ex-military person, however, I am on entitlement. And when you start talking about Social Security and attacking it and taking it and taxing it and having reinvesting it, that hurts not only myself, but it hurts a lot of people to depend on Social Security just to survive. And when we're talking about Social Security, we're talking about people who survive on a safe way, the gas companies. So you're affecting a lot of people. And I think that the illusion that Social Security is, is, is being threatened is an illusion of control. And I see that being fundamentally within the Democratic Party and pushed by the Republican Party. And I see a collusion between the two in terms of, again, we, we have to get back to people. We cannot continue to play this game with the Democratic Party or the Republican 
Republican Party because it's all hyperbole. Some things are serious, but nothing is more serious than the life of your child, my child, and that means affordable health care, one payer system if necessary. Uh, I think that universally we need to take care of our people and our education system. We cannot compete in a job market where they have taken and outsourced everything. And we used to be the leading technological people in the world. And now when we see everything outsourced, we become just a fodder fodder for those outside that are creating these things for the trillionaires and we become basically consumers. Consumers of whatever they put out, no matter what genetically induced food that they approve and no matter what medicines because they are in collusion with the pharmaceutical industry. And that keeps us sick a lot. I mean, anytime you get a, see an ad on TV says take this particular medicine but we have 30,000 side effects that you're going to witness. <laughs> that says to me that there is something wrong with America and there's something wrong with the guidance force that allows these people to run over us in this way. I get robocalls and I've never had diabetes. Hey, you called us. We, have, we understand you got diabetes. No, I do not have diabetes and please do not call me again. <laughs> mm -hmm. So these types of things or, or my contention with the Democratic Party. They are not being a party of the people as they were supposedly designed. They are being and been co-opted by the trillionaires. And that's, that's reflective even in the oil pipeline that they just struck down. But it's coming back because the Republicans want it. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the industries uh, that are choking us, and what I mean by choking is by taking away the jobs, outsourcing them, and I think that it all begins within the confines of the representatives. Now, I'm not focusing so much on the President of the United States because he, he, he's a great person and he's been ineffective. Ineffective because the Congress, the Congress, which only ratifies war, has stepped into an area of which they are ratifying every aspect of our lives. And it is proven to be and has created the 99 percent. As I've always said, I've been 99 percent all of my life, and most African Americans have. Now today, when they have destroyed the middle class, we have all come together, and we see it in Occupy, Oakland, Occupy, Portland, Occupy, New York, Occupy the waterfront. People are disenchanted with the services they're receiving from the Democratic representatives and the Republican representatives, so it's time for a change. We are the 99%. We are 99% voting power. And if we can't change the multiple candidacies that are killing us in the Democratic Party, and I, and I don't want to discount the Republican Party because they too are doing the same thing, but folks, let's look at it with the reality. They are working against us and not for us, and that's where I'm at, working for you. Staying in Congress, as my good friend said, 109 days, if necessary, not taking no vacation until it is done right. Now, I can't filibuster, because that can only be done in the Senate, but I will stand up in the Congress until they acquiesce and give us what we deserve, and that is respect. Okay. All right, very good. We have uh, about two minutes left. We both have a problem about getting media coverage. So really quickly, in a minute and a minute, how do you get media coverage? Uh, well, I've been as, as obnoxious and respectful as possible. Um, I show up to events where I've been excluded, and I stand there and I hand out business cards, and I hand out flyers. I contact media outlets. Um, I've actually received more press uh, outside of the first congressional district than within. Um, it's starting to change. I think people are starting to recognize uh, that I exist and that my candidacy is legitimate. Uh, I'm not playing the spoiler. I'm playing to win. And I have no intention of going away. So uh, www.truth2012.org, you'll see it on, on your screen. I'm not going anywhere. I, me and Mr. Broadnax, we're not going anywhere. We are the 99%, and we're going to take our values back to government where they belong. Okay, very good. Well, you, sir. We, as people, as the Constitution was designed to serve the people, have been uh, 
lambasted or kept out of the circle because of the chosen ones. I think that this campaign at the 99 percent as us an opportunity to become noticed and maybe not notice in the way in which we want to be noticed but sometimes you got to jump up and scream to be heard mm -hmm. and if that means that okay all of a sudden there's a black guy running against earl blumenauer and he's talking about people and earl is talking about this oh well, yeah we either got to shut him down or either we got to pick him up one way or the other and so my campaign is not going to be so much outrageous but it is going to be People oriented, and I don't think that the, the the that so much concerns the media because the media wants to hear about the next car crash, the next shooting, the next robbery. And when you're talking about a campaign that brings about changes, that is not a part of Rupert Murdoch or anyone else that is running the media. So we're going to have this problem, but the only way to absolve ourselves from that problem is to do as my good friend said, stand up. I'm not going anywhere. I ran for city council. I'm running for Congress. And God knows if I had not been a part of the 99% in my birth, I probably would have been the next president of the United <laughs> States. <laughs> Well, very good. Thank you very much, Woody, for being here. Thank you, Stephen, for being here. And good luck with both of your campaigns. Thank you. <clears throat> so that concludes our program for today. If you're interested in more information on the Oregon Progressive Party, there is the uh, website, uh, www.progparty.org, Pacific Green Party uh, in Portland, www.portlandgreens.org. And there's uh, web addresses for both of their specific campaigns there. The uh, Alliance for Democracy has invited Jeff Clements, who is an author and an, and an attorney uh, from Boston. He has just written a book called Corporations Are Not People, Why They Have More Rights Than You Do, and What You Can Do About It. He'll be uh, at the Unitarian Church on February 11th at 7 p.m., so you don't want to miss that. It's an excellent book. Uh, he reveals the far-reaching effects of the strange and destructive idea that corporations have human free speech rights because they are people. We know that's false. So uh, join us on uh, February 11th, 7 to 9 p.m. at the First Unitarian Church at Southwest 12th and Salmon in Portland. The mission of the Alliance for Democracy is to end corporate domination, establish true democracy, and create a just society based on a sustainable, equitable economy. Visit our national website at www.thealliancefordemocracy.org or portlandafd-pdx.org. We want to thank our crew today, Roger Bates, Joan Horton, Tom Thomas, Dave King, and Janet Morris. Without them, we wouldn't be on the air. And without you being uh, our audience, we wouldn't have any purpose for being on the air. So thank you. Hope we'll see you next week. <laughs>